Yes, the Holy Spirit continues to wow me as we are in our Ephesian study. We're going through the armor of God. And today we are dealing with the footwear of the soldier of Christ. How fitting on Mother's Day to be considering the shoes we are to wear. I read this week that men's shoes are the sale of men's shoes is on the rise in America today, only remaining about a couple of billion dollars behind the sale of women's shoes. Except for the Greer House, right? You've asked me more than once who has more shoes, you or Tanya. If you count flip-flops as shoes, Tanya has way more shoes than I do. If you don't count flip-flops as shoes, I have no comment on the question. Shoes are important to most of us, I mean, at least on some level. I mean, if you're here today, you most likely wore a pair of shoes here today. Most likely. We wear different shoes for different activities. So I've got pairs of shoes, I want to show you pictures of them, and you just tell me what activity you would engage in while wearing these shoes. Dancing, tap dancing. You know, Southern Baptist pastors have, have often been asked, can Baptists dance? And the answer is some can and some can't. Right? How about these shoes? What kind of activity? Line dancing. Did I hear that? Rodeoing. Yeah. Or riding a horse. Or... All right, how about the, y'all remember the Reebok pumps? You wouldn't bend down to tie them, you'd bend down to pump them up. You remember that? they make you jump higher, right? No, they wouldn't. Just in your mind. All right, how about these? That's right. Lose your temper in these shoes, right? I don't own a pair of these. Probably never will. How about the next? Bowling. I own two pairs of those shoes. Next is... Yeah, I call these nonsensical shoes. Like, What would you wear those to? And Not very practical. And then, of course... Crocs. These ensure that you'll never be cool again. Now, I'm joking. Crocs are cool. I'm joking about the Crocs. So what is the appropriate footwear for a believer, for a follower of Jesus, for a soldier of God? What is the proper footwear for a believer? That's what Paul's dealing with here in Ephesians 6. So I'm going to read again. I'm going to start in verse 10, read through 15. We're going to park out, camp out in verse 15. So verse 10. Finally... Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand firm, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Stop right there. As we pray, Heavenly Father, would you have us hear from you? Holy Spirit, would you teach us? Would you give us the ability to repent today, to hear and receive the gospel, to stand on the gospel, to respond to the gospel, to be challenged, convicted, encouraged? Lord, teach us. Remove all of us and let Christ be lifted high in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. so here's our takeaway. Our sermon in a sentence is this. Gospel shoes make us ready to share the gospel. Gospel shoes make us ready to share the gospel. So when you shoe your feet with the gospel of peace, it makes you ready to share the gospel. And so when you put those, when you when you Shoe your feet with the gospel of peace. There's three activities that we ought to be involved in. We're going to work through each one of them 
in our time remaining together this morning. Here's the first one. Gospel shoes ready us to stabilize. We need some stability. Would you agree with that? In this unstable world, we need some stability. And these shoes of of the readiness of the gospel of peace, they stabilize us. These gospel shoes ready us to stabilize. Well, why do we need spiritual stability? Why do we need to be spiritually stable? Well, the month of May is a good example of what may happen in life. I mean, you know this as much as I do. In the month of May, it may rain. It may snow. It may be 20 degrees. It may be 90 degrees. It may be so hot in the month of May that two hobbits ring your ring doorbell. When you open the door, they throw a ring inside your house. May is all over the place. And May reminds us of the reality of life. There's ups and downs. There's, there, there, there's, there's good days. There's bad days. There's ugly days. There's highs and there's lows. So in all this unstable, up and down, day after day, how are we to live with stability? How are we to be stable in an unstable world? How, how, are, we to, how are we to be like spiritual oak trees in a world of spiritual tumbleweeds that are tossed to and fro by the wind and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunningness, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Because truth be told, listen, Satan loves unbalanced believers. He loves unstable saints. He loves cockeyed Christ followers. He loves spiritual tumbleweeds that are tossed to and fro. Satan eats that up. So how are we to be stable? Well, this is what Paul is dealing with in our text today. Our footwear. Number one, to be stable. Stability. And he says it this way. He uses the word and. Somebody say and. This is not or. Again, we're not called to pick out the armor. You get to pick out whatever piece you want to put on. Like pick out this piece or that piece or that piece or that. No, no, no. It's not or. It's and. This is a link in a chain connecting all the pieces of armor that you are to put it on and then put this piece on and then put that piece on and then put this piece on. Already we put on the belt of truth. The belt of truth, not the belt of tradition, not the belt of what is trendy, not the belt of what is trending, or the belt of try harder, but the belt of truth. Somebody say truth. We've already put on the breastplate of righteousness. Somebody say righteousness. Not the breastplate of self-righteousness, not the breastplate of religiousness, Not the breastplate of relativeness or rottenness or rudeness, but righteousness. We've already put those on. Our third piece of the armor is to shoe our feet with the gospel of peace. This is the third piece of the armor. And so if you take all of this armor and you really look at it, basically what Paul is telling us to do, put on Jesus Be Jesus in your Jerusalem. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth. So put on the belt of truth. Put on Jesus. Jesus, uh, he who knew no sin became sin for us so that in him and through him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus is our righteousness. So we put on Jesus. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Right? Right? And so we're to put him on, shoe our feet with the gospel of peace. In other words, we're just to get under the armor of God. Just like David, when he fought Goliath, he was under the armor of God. He didn't get under the armor of King Saul. King Saul told him, you better wear this armor because look at that giant. And look at his giant armor. I mean, Goliath was, a, was massive. But his armor, one piece of his armor weighed 125 pounds. His spear weighed 30 pounds. The spearhead weighed 15 pounds. This, this, this guy was huge. So King Saul said, well, you've got to have some armor. And he tried to put his own armor on King David, and he just, he just couldn't use it. He said, I'm not tested it. It's, 
doesn't fit right, it's too big. And So David went under the armor of God in the name of the Lord. That's what David said to the giant Goliath. You come at me with spear and javelin and sword, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, under the armor of God, in the name of the Lord. And so we too are to put on the spiritual armor of God and fight our spiritual giants in the name of Jesus. Put on Jesus. Today we are to shoe our feet. Notice what it says here in verse 15. As shoes for your feet. This means to bind or to tie. A Roman soldier's footwear, they weren't slippers, they were sandals. They were made of leather. And they would wrap around the leg and tie all the way up to under the knee. So they'd wrap them all the way around their calf muscle and they tied up under the knee. And on the bottom of those leather sandals, they were studded on the soles. Kind of like a golf shoe or a football cleat or athletic cleat. And it would, they would use that for stability. They could stand their ground. They would not slip. They would not fall. Stability. And so we are to shoe our feet, fit our feet. Some translations say, shod your feet. Sounds like a line from the movie The Prince's Bride, right? Shod your feet with the, with the readiness of the gospel of peace. And this stability, this steadiness, this sturdiness, this sure-footedness comes from the gospel of peace. Spiritually. As Paul says in Romans 5.1, what does he say? Since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God. This is how we can stand. This is where our stability comes from because through Christ, faith in Him, we are at peace with God. That's why this is so important. That's why this gospel of peace is peace in two ways. And the first way this peace is to be understood is that we are at peace with God through faith in God the Son. Why is that important? Church, listen. The, these, these two families that we saw up here, we had some other families at the Point Church this morning that we did commissioning there as well, and all these babies. Every baby that's ever born is not born at peace with God. When you were born, you were not born at peace with God. You were born as an enemy of God, at enmity with God. You, you were born alienated from God, separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise. That's why this commissioning is so vitally important. Because as moms and dads, and as church, and as, and as those volunteering to teach our children and students, it is our responsibility to point them to the only hope they have, to point them to Jesus, and to pray for the day when they will realize their sin has separated them from God, and Jesus is their only Savior and their only hope. And we pray for the day that they'll personally come to know Christ as Savior. Because we are all born as enemies of God, not at peace with God. The only time one is at peace with God, that moment happens when you are born again. When you come to faith in Christ. And this is so important. That's why moms and dads are critical. You're on the front lines. Charles Haddon Spurgeon said it this way. Here's what, here's what Spurgeon said. The devil never reckons a man to be lost so long as... He has a God-fearing, Jesus-following, spirit-filled mother still alive. The power of a praying mama. Amen? But if you're in Christ, if you're a believer, if you're at peace with God the Father through faith in God the Son, and look, we're thankful for all moms. I'm so thankful for every God-fearing mom, especially God-fearing moms, but thankful for all moms. But if you're a believer and you're a follower of Jesus, you have a heavenly Father, God the Father. And therefore, it doesn't matter if you've got a God-fearing mama, a God-awful mama, or no mama at all. If you're in Christ, you have a Father. 
And if you're at peace with the Father, if, if God is for you, who can be against you? Man, this gives us stability. This stabilizes us to take all the fiery darts from the enemy, to take all the storms, to take all the ups and downs, standing on the truth of the gospel of peace, that through Christ we are at peace with God. And if God is for us, who can be against us? So why is this so important? Well, the gospel... As Paul preaches it in 1 Corinthians, he makes this comment before he again reminds them of the gospel. He says, now I remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, in which you have stability. What is that gospel? That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. That's the gospel. We don't graduate from that. You don't graduate from the gospel and go into deeper stuff. We never move on from the gospel. That's the gospel. Jesus died for our sins in accordance with the Bible. That He was buried and raised on the third day in accordance with the Bible. This is the good news. Why is this important? Because the Bible says those who think they stand must take heed lest they fall. And they fall hard, church, hard. My grandfather was a United Methodist pastor. If he were alive today, he would not stand for what has recently occurred at the United Methodist Conference whereby United Methodist delegates voted 692 to 51. 692 4 51 against, to no longer forbid gay clergy and same-sex marriage. This is an abandonment of God's design of marriage. This is an abandonment of God's holy word. And the truth is, this world, our nation, America, needs strong, conservative, Bible-believing, Christ-following Methodists and Methodist churches. That's the truth. And it doesn't matter the denomination. I tell you, if, if the Southern Baptist Convention ever moves off the Word of God, we're out, church. I stand on the Word of truth. The Gospel. Period. So to our Christ-following friends, United Methodist friends, listen, I, incur, I implore you to, to stand on the truth and find a conservative branch of the Methodist church and be a part of that or get out altogether if you can't because you don't want to be found standing on that day when Christ comes again without having your, shoe, your, your feet shoed with the gospel of peace. When a church changes its stance to match the current culture, They are not following the God of the Word. They're following the God of this world. That's who they're following. And we will not stand for that. Because we stand on the Gospel. And when you have peace with God, it is so liberating. It sets you free. When you have peace with God, you know what Jesus has to say. And you can know what Jesus has said about the Bible. Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. (laughs) When you have peace with God, you can know what Jesus says about salvation. When when I look at at Sam, I, I think there's no way Sam can be saved. But when I look at Jesus, I think there's no way Sam can be lost. And when you are at peace with God, you know what Jesus has said about creation. That you are not a clump of cells. You did not descend from apes. You are created on purpose for a purpose. When you have peace with God, you can know what Jesus says about the devil. He's real. He's a murderer. He's a thief. He's a liar. And praise God, he's defeated. And when you're at peace with God, you can know what Jesus has said about marriage between one man and and one woman. It's a covenant for life. It's not till love do us part. 
It's not till life do us part. It's till death do us part. It's a lifetime commitment and covenant. When you're at peace with God, you can know that, hey, our God is sovereign. Our Savior, He's still alive. Our sins are still forgiven. Our hope is secure. And our King is coming. We should be the most joyful people on planet Earth because we have the stability of the gospel of peace. Man! What an incredible gospel that, yes, we're all born at war with God, but through Christ we have peace with God. Man, what? Wow, it gives us great stability. And because we have peace with God, we, we can take on anything under the armor of God. Secondly, gospel shoes ready us to mobilize us. Not only are we stable, we need to be mobile. We need to be able to move, right? <laughs> Physically, how, how do you... What is important for your physical health? Well, move. Doesn't matter if you swim, bike, walk, just move, right? I know as older you get, it's harder to stay in shape. I'm at the age now where the only fitness model job I'd ever be hired for is the before picture. I understand that. But it's important to move, isn't it? And, and athletic shoes give us the ability to, to, to stabilize and mobilize. Good athletic shoes. So good spiritual shoes gives us the ability to be stable and stand on truth, but also be mobile. So it gives us mobility. And that's the picture we see Paul painting here when he says, having put on the readiness given by the gospel. You've got to be ready to move. You've got to be prepared to go. You can't spell gospel without the word go. The gospel has come to you because it's on its way to somebody else. The gospel, Paul says, cannot be chained. It is moving. And so we've got to be ready to move. We've got to not only be stable, but we having put on the readiness given by the gospel. Please. So the peace with God stabilizes us. The peace of God. Here's the other part of the peace. We have the peace of God. The peace of God enables us to be mobile. Paul says it this way in Philippians 4. He says, do not be anxious about anything. Some of you are so anxious, you're paralyzed. You are frozen in fear. And you cannot move. You cannot make a decision. You cannot move this way or that because you're paralyzed. And so here's what Paul says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is the peace we have in Christ. Christ gives us peace with God and the peace of God. That you can walk into a chaotic situation and bring peace. And if you have the peace of God, through faith in Christ, guess what? Your family, your friends, your neighbors, your co-workers, your circle of influence, they're watching you and your family go through that trouble, go through that tragedy, and they see you at perfect peace and they're thinking to themselves, how are they not losing it? How are they not falling apart? How are they not... And you just point them to Jesus. You say, I have peace not only with God, but I have the peace of God because... Of Jesus. They will notice that. This is why Paul quoted Isaiah 52 in Romans when he said, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. <laughs> the context of that is in ancient times when they would two, two, two armies would battle, one would be defeated, one would be victorious, and the victorious army would send messengers back to their people to tell them the good news. The war has been won. Hey church, we have good news. Satan is defeated. Jesus is on the throne. He's been resurrected. He's alive. He's our hope. Jesus is coming. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Take the good news with you when you go into those chaotic situations and be the peace that they need. 
Look at this word. Somebody say ready. ready. Say ready. ready. Readiness. This, this word means prepared. Okay? Preparedness. It means in the active sense, it means to make ready. I'm going to make something ready. In the passive sense, it means be ready. This is the same word. I was having a conversation with one of our church members this week and I'm going to borrow some, some of that conversation and share it with you today. This word readiness is the same word that is used by the Lord Jesus in the original language, the same word that's used when Jesus is talking to His disciples. And He tells His disciples, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Same word. Now, why did Jesus speak that way? Why was he talking to his disciples in that way? Well, his disciples, he called them from Galilee. They were Galileans. And Jesus would often use, as he talked about himself and his followers, he would use this imagery of, 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 of the bride, and that was the mystery of marriage. You have the bride, and you have the groom, and you have Jesus as the bridegroom, the church as his bride. So Jesus sometimes would talk using Galilean wedding language. Galilean wedding was some different from other Eastern weddings in that not all of them were arranged. In fact, most Eastern weddings, I know in our mind we think arranged marriages, but not so with a Galilean wedding. The bride had the choice to reject or receive the proposal. If she drank the cup of wine that the groom-to-be would bring her, that means she would receive this invitation, this proposal. If she rejected it, it means she refused it. So you and I have the choice. We can either receive the bridegroom's invitation to come to him, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest, or we can reject it. If the bride-to-be received the proposal, they would enter into this time of betrothal period, lasted around a year, where the groom would leave the bride-to-be and go, get this, go to his father's house. And he would go to his father's house to prepare a room on his father's house for him and his bride. This is why Jesus told his disciples, in my father's house are many rooms. I go there to prepare a place for you. Because being Galileans, they would have understood the Galilean wedding imagery here. And as the, bride, as the groom would go prepare the place for him and his bride, the bride would also get ready. She's working on her dress and all the preparations and she's getting ready because she doesn't know when the groom's coming to get her. So she's going to make sure she's ready when he comes to get her. And here's the kicker. In the Galilean betrothal, the groom had no idea when he was going to go get his bride. His father would tell him when it was time to go get his bride. This is why Jesus says in Matthew 24, nobody knows the time or date. Not even the Son, but only the Father knows the time or day. And the Father, one day, God the Father is going to tell God the Son, go get your bride. And Jesus is going to split the sky. And the trumpet's going to blast. You know how that groom in, in the Galilean, do you know how he would announce to the village that it was time for the marriage banquet? He'd blow the trumpet. And they would hear, and sometimes it would be at midnight, an odd time, and they would hear that, and they would come. And if they didn't get there in time and the door shut, they didn't get in. you got to be ready. Oh, my soul, you got to be ready. We're talking about eternity here. We're not talking about the temporary. We're not talking about religion. We're not talking about denominations. We're talking about life and death eternally. Heaven or hell eternally. And so these gospel shoes of peace, when you put them on, you have peace with God. You have the peace of God. You can be stable and mobile and you can go and make sure your family is aware that Jesus the Christ is coming for His church, His bride. Are you ready? 
Oh, these gospel shoes make us ready to share the gospel. These doctor shoals that a believer's wearing is readying that believer to go do the work of an evangelist. Those flip-flops ready as a believer to flat out be fishers of men. Those hey dudes ready as a believer to go share the good news. So go share. Why? Because these shoes, they stabilize us, they mobilize us, but thirdly, these gospel shoes ready us to gospelize. Now, that is just a fancy word to mean share the gospel with somebody, okay? We go gospelize people. We take the gospel of peace to people. We gospelize people with the gospel of peace. John, our 11-year-old, today is his gotcha day. We adopted him one year ago today. Praise God for that, amen? Today's his gotcha day. And he told me, he said, I got an idea for mom for Mother's Day. I said, okay, what is it? He said, you and I are going to go get her a gift, and I'm going to get 50% credit for the gift, and you'll get 50% credit for the gift. I said, okay, are we going to split the cost 50-50? He said, absolutely not. But I'm going to still get credit for half of the gift. And it made me think about, man, how many times do we op- try to operate that way with God and oftentimes do operate that way with God and tell God, God, I'm going to take some credit for this one. God, I'm going to take the glory for this one. And we become glory thieves and we start stealing the glory of God. When it comes to the gospel, he's, he gets 100% of the credit. We get 0% of the credit. He gets it all. So we point them to Him not to ourselves, this gospel of peace. This is an important idea here. This is not the gospel of performance where you get some of the credit and give God some credit. This isn't the gospel of performance. This is the gospel of partiality where you get part of the credit and God gets part of the credit. This isn't the gospel of pedigree where you rely on your heritage and your family who were Christian that somehow that makes you Christian. That's not the gospel of pedigree. This isn't the gospel of prosperity. One of my favorite MMA fights of all time is watching a prosperity preacher try to make it through the book of Job. Right? This isn't the gospel of prosperity. It's not the gospel of partiality or the gospel of performance. It's the gospel of peace. Jesus said, my peace I give to you. My peace I leave with you. In fact, take your Bibles. Go to Ephesians 2, verse number 14. Ephesians 2, 14. Chapter 2, Ephesians 2, verse 14. What is this peace that Paul speaks of? Ephesians 2, 14. Here we go. For he himself is our peace. Jesus is our peace. Church, Peace is a person. It's not a position. It's not a performance. Peace is a person. He goes on to say, look what he goes on to say there in the same section in verse 14, down into verse 15. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. Look at this. That he might create in himself one new man in the place of the two. Watch. So making peace. Peace is a person. Peace isn't a treaty that two two parties enter into. Peace is the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Peace is a person. Peace is not the absence of a crisis. It's the presence of Christ. It's not the absence of trouble. It's the presence of truth. It's not the absence of a mess. It's the presence of the Messiah. Peace is a person. And we need this gospel every day because we sin every day. We don't move on from the gospel. This gospel has worked for 2,000 years. It still works. So stick to the gospel and share the gospel and shoe your feet with the gospel shoes of peace so you can go and share the gospel. For the believer, those name brand Nikes, they ready you to go share the name that's above every name. Those Toms ready as a believer to go tell the untold. Those Vans ready as a believer to go give the gospel a voice. Go share the gospel. Why do we need 
to do what Paul is instructing us to do and put on. We've seen this a number of times in the armor of God, having put on, put on, put on again. The put on here doesn't mean just put it on. It means keep it on. Somebody say keep it on. You put it on, you keep it on, you don't take it off. Every other uniform that somebody wears, they're going to take it off. A police officer will take it off. A fireman will take it off. You know, the, the cool thing about firemen I, that I've learned is they have their shoes that they wear already inside the uniform they wear. Like their uniform and shoes are already put together, so they just jump in it, pull it up, and off they go, right? They're ready. They have it ready. But even firemen take it off when they're not fighting fires, right? Well, we don't get to take it off. You put it on, you don't take it off. Why is this important? Go back to King David. David's giant was not Goliath. When David was under the armor of God on the battlefield facing Goliath, that was not his, most, that was not his toughest battle. David's giant was not Goliath. David's giant was Bathsheba. When he decided not to go to battle. When he decided to take the armor of God off and stay home. You can't take this off. Keep it on. Keep it on. Keep it on. Let me say one thing to believers and then something to our, those that say I've never trusted Christ. Number one, to the believer, we're to be peacemakers, not just peacekeepers. We're to bring peace with us wherever we go. So this week, you're going to walk into some chaos. I mean, you're going to walk into some chaos this week. So what do you do? You bring peace with you. You bring the gospel of peace with you. And you speak into that chaos. And yet, Jesus may not calm your chaos, but He's always the calm in it. So rest in Him and trust in Him and be a peacemaker and take peace with you this week. Don't just try to keep the peace. Tell two parties not to argue, but make peace. Bring peace into the situation. Point them to the Prince of Peace. Secondly, for anybody who would say, I'm, I've never trusted Christ as my Savior, let me be frank with you. If you've never put your faith in Christ, you're still at war with God and God's wrath is coming after you. And you're still an enemy of God. And the only way you can be at peace with God is through faith in His Son and what He did for you on the cross of Calvary. Dying in your place and instead of you. Taking your sin upon Himself. Dying and being buried and then raised on the third day. And the Bible says if you believe that in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that you'll be saved. So I'm going to ask you to stand with me and we're going to pray. We're going to have an invitation and we're going to worship in song. Father, I pray in the name of Christ that you would help us to shoe our feet with the gospel of peace. That it would stabilize us, mobilize us, and help us gospelize others as we go. To point them to Jesus and not to ourselves. Let us make peace as we go, taking the peace of God with us. Lord, for every unbeliever or those in the room that say, I'm just not sure if I've put my faith in Christ, Lord, I pray that you would speak to them, stir their hearts, let them know today is a day that their inner war can end and they can have peace with you through faith in your Son but they have to turn from their sin. They have to humble themselves and admit their sin and turn to you in repentance, turning away from sin and putting their trust in you. Lord, I pray they'll do it right now. You call on Jesus and He'll save you now. You can pray something like this. I know I'm a sinner, Father. I believe Jesus. I know He's my only hope. He's my Savior. I'm ready to trust Him now. Forgive me in Jesus' name. You just call on His name. Believing in your heart. Father, if there's anybody here that would say, yeah, I, I want to I be baptized. Man, I need to join the church. Or I want to answer a call to ministry. Or I've got a prayer need in my life. Or a prayer request. I, 
encourage them to come during this time of invitation. We give you the glory in it all. In Jesus' name, amen. If you want to come pray or have someone pray with you, you come as we worship.